All right, it looks like we are now live. Hello, everyone. My name is Bryn Jackson, and I am the Assistant Curator of Audience Engagement and Performance at Newfields. In 1978, Monica Mayer presented El Tenderero, or The Clothesline, an installation at El Museo de Arte Moderno in Mexico City. This artwork invited women of different ages, occupations, and neighborhoods to respond to the phrase, as a woman, what I dislike about this city is, on small pink slips, which were placed on a three by two meter clothesline. Most answers denounced sexual harassment in the street and public transport. Since then, El Tenderero has been activated more than 30 times across the globe in vastly different communities, responding to issues of violence against women. In 2019, Women for Change, an organization whose mission is to educate, equip, and mobilize Hoosiers to create positive change for women, invited the artist to activate El Tenderero in Indianapolis. This initiative, which was collaboratively realized through more than 70 partnerships, resulted in more than 1,500 responses from women in each of Indiana's 92 counties, collected over the course of 150 programs. These note cards were ultimately presented at the Indiana State House on March 5th of this year to raise awareness among state lawmakers of the extent to which women experience sexual harassment and assault with the goal of persuading them to create legislation that defines consent. It is with, with great pleasure that I announce to you all today that the Indianapolis Museum of Art at Newfields will be bringing this historic work into our collection to ensure that women will continue to have a platform from which to voice their experiences in the hopes that we may one day bring an end to rape culture. Here with me today is Patricia Castaneda, uh, board chair of Women for Change, to tell us a little bit more about how this initiative unfolded. Um, so I'll go ahead and pass the mic over to, to Patricia. Thank you, Brain. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I am very happy to be able to be with you and tell you the story about Women for Change women change makers, and El Tendedero, the clothesline Indiana. It was um, in uh, 2018 that we got together as a group um, of, uh, of women as an ad hoc committee of Women for Change to form the change makers. And this is a group of women that uh, find issues that are relevant to the state of women in the state of Indiana to give space to speak uh, in a civically minded and civil way between subject matter experts um, and as well as representatives of our legislator, uh, legislative body, both uh, Democrats and Republicans together with our civic uh, groups uh, in Indiana to be able to delve into issues that affect women. One of those issues identified was sexual assault the and uh, and then we we just happened to be led by uh, one uh, wonderful uh, patron of the arts and stack who actually brought uh, a magazine out at one of our meetings that talked about this great project from a wonderful artist called Monica Mayer um, and said, look at this, look at what was done, look at what is happening all over the world and wouldn't it be great if we could actually bring this project to Indiana and how can we do that? And as a group, we became so excited about the possibility and actually envisioned how El Tendedero could be an installation at the State House, which was um, uh, actually uh, something that happened on March 5th of 2020. Um, one of the last uh, times that we were able to get together. When uh, that initial um, impulse happened, we actually did not know how this was going to be so revolutionary in that the arts, activist communities, as well as civic communities came together to advocate for consent legislation in the state house in Indiana. Um, we do not have a definition of consent in our state legislature in the state of Indiana. And we thought that that was worth letting people know about, educate people on why it is important to have it. And, uh, and also through the uh, many voices that we were able to collect around the 92 counties in the state of Indiana, we were able to display a beautiful 
and meaningful. I think that um, uh, it was it was a moment of joy and sadness that um, that only happens when art speaks to you, um, with all of the voices quietly being shown in the uh, at the state house. Over 1,500 cars were collected, and actually each legislator legislator received copies of their own constituents from their own um, uh, from their own areas in an envelope on their on their desk that morning, so that they could hear from their own constituents for them. Um, I think that that was very powerful. We had many legislators that had not really been part of the conversation with us at that point come down and find out more about it. And it was a um, it was really a dream come true. It was a vision that came through through the work that was inspired by Monica. Mayor, the work that we did in collaboration with all of these organizations. I'm really, really happy to and proud to have been a part of this as uh, Women for Change Indiana. And, and the work continues. And we continue to have this as part of our conversation and as part of, of our efforts going forward. And uh, as we celebrate four years of being an organization and having been given the challenge uh, very early in January of 2017, when we met with Governor Holcomb to make sure that we make this a statewide organization, I think that we were able to uh, convey the fact that all of the voices from all of 92 counties in, in Indiana are being heard through this project. And uh, thank you so much to Newfields uh, for seeing the importance of this project from from the artistic and civic um, point of view. And I really look forward to seeing it for years to come as an installation at Newfields. And thank you, Monica, for the inspiration for this. Thank you, Patricia. And uh, thank you to Women for Change for organizing this historic collaboration. Uh, thank you as well to Monica for bringing the important work to Indiana. And finally, thank you to Ann Stack, without whose generous support and commitment to the health and well-being of our community, this project would not be possible. Um, so uh, we're here um, here with me today um, uh, to discuss Monica's practice, our writer and curator, uh, Karen Cord Cordero Ryman, and artist Monica Mayer. Uh, Karen Cordero Ryman is an art historian, curator, and writer based in Mexico City. She is the author of numerous publications in her areas of special specialization. Uh, which include 20th and 21st century Mexican art, the relationship between the so-called fine arts and the so-called popular arts in Mexico, the historiography of Mexican art, body, gender, and sexual identity in Mexican art, and museological and curatorial discourses in Mexico. She has collaborated with museums in various capacities, including curator, advisor, and researcher. Currently, she works as an independent researcher and curator, as well as um, on personal creative projects that relate art, literature, and history. She has curated several exhibitions of uh, Monica's art, including the major retro collective show of her work in 2016 at the University Museum of Contemporary Art in Mexico City, and has written and lectured extensively on feminist art in Mexico. Monica Mayer studied visual arts in Mexico uh, and received an MA in Sociology of Art from Goddard College and participated in the Feminist Studio Workshop at the Women's Building in Los Angeles. Her work as an artist includes performances, drawing, writing, teaching, and activism. She founded Polvo de Gallina Negra, uh, which translates to Black Hen's Dust, which was the first feminist art collective in Mexico with Maris Bustamante in 1983. In 1989, with Victor Lerma, uh, she started Pinto Miraya, a long-term applied conceptual art project, uh, whose goal is to lubricate the art system and has led to the creation of an important archive. Mayer has published several books, including uh, Rosa Chiante, uh, Mujeres y Performance in Mexico, uh, which translates to Bright Pink, Women and Performance in Mexico. She had a column in El Universal newspaper for 20 years. She has participated in major international exhibitions such as WAC, Art and the Feminist Revolution at the Museum of Contemporary Art in LA and MoMA PS1 in New York. Um, and Radical Women, Latin American Art 1960 to 1985 at the Hammer Museum. 
She is a member of the Sistema Nacional uh, de Creadores, um, or the National System of Creators, and is working on a project on art and archives. Um, so before we get started, um, you know, please be sure to post any questions that you may have in the chat, and I'll be sure to include them in the Q&A after the presentation. Um, and at this point, I will go ahead and pass the mic over to Karen. As the slides. Well, let me go to my. Can you see the full screen now? Yes, we can. Okay. Well. Um, okay. So thank you very much, Bryn and Lindsay for this invitation. I'd really like to thank Newfields for the invitation to participate in this conversation in the closing event of this unprecedented year-long activation of Monica Myers' The Clothesline in Indiana that Patricia has just described. The Clothesline, El Tendedero, is an iconic work <clears throat> in relation to feminist art and activism not only because of its relationship to an emerging feminist consciousness and its relevance to the issue of gender violence, but because of the ways it creates and recreates methodologies that depart from patriarchal models of authorship, conceiving a structure that transforms both the conventional parameters of the art system and those of social activism. So in this brief talk, I'd like to address the transformation and continued pertinence of this participatory process-based work originally produced in 1978 and recreated in various contexts since that time, as Bryn has mentioned, that makes visible verbal testimonies of gender-based experiences of violence. Using a structure that alludes to a traditionally feminine everyday activity, hanging up clothes to dry, Meyer invites the public to share their experiences of the city, violence, insecurity, identity, and harassment. I'm going to focus on the history and context of this work in Mexico and its reactivation in recent years that has allowed it to create a bridge between art and activism in a distinct manner and fomented a dialogue between feminist processes in Mexico and other nations. And then Monica is going to talk about the more recent activations and the current state of the close line. The unfortunate immediate context for this extraordinary vitality uh, and interest in the close line is the presence of and persistence of violence and particularly gender-based violence in Mexico which has reached epidemic proportions increasing over the course of the past for decades, in spite of the fact that they coincide with the growth of the feminist movement and the social, legal, and political initiatives that seek to create consciousness, control, and sanction it. This speaks both to less conscious social phenomena that underlie this problem, as well as a continuing need for visibilization, analysis, and protest in this respect. And as it has become evident in what has been known as the Me Too movement, and in the recent section of the clothesline, this phenomenon is a generalized characteristic of contemporary society on a transnational level. The initial tenderero or clothesline was created by Monica Meyer in 1978 when she was just finishing art school. In the context of a collective exhibition of young artists, in the Museum of Modern Art in Mexico City, organized as a result of the initiative of one of their professors. The subject agreed upon by consensus among the group was the city, then in a process of rapid growth and transformation, 
affecting changes both on an interpersonal and structural level. Influenced by the conceptual actions that were being explored by artists groups of the time, as well as by the emergent feminist movement, she invented the vehicle that was the basis of the concept of the piece. Small pink slips of paper with a sentence to be completed. As a woman, what, it, what I detest most about the city is, as you can see on the screen. And these slips were distributed among women in different social contexts for feedback and then hung on a simulated clothesline in the museum gallery, where the responses continued to accumulate and incite dialogue, both directly through the public's reception and in writing on the clothesline sheets themselves. Okay. So from 1971 on, various feminist collectives and organizations were being formed in Mexico that organized consciousness raising groups. Their public demonstrations and protests, some of which we can see here, incorporated different resources from the arts and experimental theater that today would be understood as related to feminist performance and art practice. Their demands included the legalization of abortion and end to violence and discrimination against women, access to better health services and equal opportunities. The coincidence of Maya's formation as an artist in Mexico City and later in the feminist studio workshop in Los Angeles with this consolidation of the feminist movement in Mexico and of course around the world was fundamental for the development of her work. She conceives of her vocation and artistic production in the light of feminism since that time, integrating its concepts into both the subject matter and form of her work, as well as into her understanding of the art system. The work Maya created during her formative period in Mexico and Los Angeles reflects the development of a visual and conceptual language that takes as its basis women's bodies and their social and sexual experiences, as well as questioning the stereotypes of femininity in Mexican culture, as we can see here in the Diary of Everyday Violences. She frequently uses her own image and everyday materials that don't form a part of traditional art practice, such as sewing, for example, on the images, in order to debunk and ironize these conventions. In the fall of 1978, Meyer traveled to Los Angeles to participate in the Feminist Studio Workshop program in the Women's Building in Los Angeles, where artists such as Judy Chicago, Arlene Raven, Suzanne Lacey, and others were participating in the generation of feminist art in the US. Working closely with Suzanne Lacey, who together with Leslie Labowitz had formed Ariadne, a social art network, she learned about and explored the theory and implementation of social art practice, which promoted a process-based strategy of social action and intervention through art. In the context of Lacey and Labowitz's project, Making It Safe, in the Ocean Park area of LA, she developed a second clothesline in which she explored more radical exhibition strategies in non-art spaces, from the street to local libraries, as well as on ephemeral clotheslines, as you can see here, strung between lampposts, utility poles, and other artifacts of the urban milieu. She also honed her abilities in linking art, social action, and activism, since the questions posed by the piece in this case address not only the problem, but possible solutions. Upon Meyer's return to Mexico, her work continued to move between the individual and the collective, the public and the private. In 1983, together with Maris Bustamante, she formed Polvo de Gallina Negra, the first feminist art group in Mexico, and for a decade carried out performances and actions for live publics and through mass media. And in the ensuing years, her artistic production has positioned her as perhaps the most persistent referent of Mexican feminist art. The clothesline became one of her signature pieces and was exhibited as photographic documentation in shows of feminist art and activist art, both in Mexico and abroad, 
for example, as we can see here in WAC, the major retrospective of feminist art in 2007 in Los Angeles. However, the piece was not reactivated as a participatory piece until 2009 in an exhibition organized by art history students at the Universidad Iberoamericana, where I was a professor actually at the time and for many years, and then was not activated again until 2015. In the past five years, however, the piece seems to have become what we might term viral on a national and international level, spurring new developments in its process-based structure and its appropriation by activist groups, as is the case in Indianapolis, as well as art institutions, as a way of generating collective interactions around issues of gender-based violence and a greater appreciation of the social potential of art in areas where political action has run short. In October 2015, in the M MDE 15, a citywide art event in Medellin, Colombia, an area that has been plagued by issues of social violence that link it to contemporary Mexico, Meyer not only exhibited the documentation of the piece from the 1970s, but also created a new clothesline, introducing elements in its conception that reflected her ensuing development and her recent concerns as an artist with feminist pedagogy, the creation of interdisciplinary networks, the dialogue with younger generations, and the form formation of accomplices or cronies in the interstices of art and activism. A key factor in this respect was a workshop coordinated by Meyer in which the participants worked together to generate the questions and processes for collecting answers for the tendedero in relation to their specific social and political context. The piece was not conceived primarily at this point as a physical object, but in terms of the dialogical process in public spaces through which it was generated and which it continued to activate through its presentation and activation in a museum context. One example of the reverberations produced by this methodology was the creation the spontaneous creation of a clothesline in a Medellin secondary school with questions generated also in that specific context. In 2016, I curated a retrospective of Meyer's work at the University Museum of Contemporary Art, known as MOAC in Mexico City, titled When in Doubt, Ask, a retrocollective exhibition of Monica Meyer. Retrocollective, refers precisely to the blurring of individual authorship in many of her pieces as a result of their participatory and collective character. And the first section of the exhibit, kind of prologue, was called Tendiendo Redes, Setting Up Networks, introducing the span of Meyer's work precisely through the evolution of the clothesline throughout her production. It also included the creation of a new version of the work for and throughout the course of the exhibition, one of several strategies of activation inherent to the show's conception. In reflecting on the pertinence of the reactivation of a work initiated decades ago, Meyer has noted not only the persistence, but the increase in harassment and gender-based violence. However, she has also underlined that today, unlike in the 1970s, there are many groups of activists and artists visibilizing this issue and promoting strategies of resistance. As a result, the installation included a computer and monitor that not only served as a supplementary method for participation of the public, but also made available information on artistic and social initiatives with respect to harassment, the subject on which the questions in this case, as in Medellin, focused. A comparison that we can see here of the questions on the clotheslines mentioned above suggests the ways in which the piece has increasingly articulated 
a conception that cuts across boundaries and weaves a stronger relationship between art, academic, and educational institutions, and activism. For instance, in the, in the questions related to the MWAC clothesline, one of the questions is, have you been harassed in school or in university? The Mark Tenderero also included an expanded workshop dynamic that began months before the inauguration of the exhibit, not only generating the materials for the piece, but also involving the participants, many of them young artists, in the conception of their own individual and collective artwork dealing with gender-based violence. The Mark Tenderero and exhibit also coincided with a heightened social consciousness and surge of visible social and institutional actions around harassment that contributed to the resignification of the work as an activist vehicle, expanding the impact of art very directly into the social and political sphere. Among the aspects highlighted by this process are that the work permits collective participation that preserves and visibilizes individual testimony and experience while underlining a collective process of consciousness raising and political initiative. It also literally makes evident the critical dimensions of the problem in terms that underline the relation of the personal and the political. Among the groups that took up, replicated and appropriated the artistic activist model of the tenderero or clothesline, both with and without Meyer's participation were Amnesty International, as we can see here, and feminist groups in Yaxacatecas, a state in northern Mexico, as well as school teachers and their students. The workshop participants also created additional initiatives, artworks and ideas that activated the performance and humor-based qualities that characterize Meyer's feminist artwork strategy. And for a major mobilization with respect to gender-based violence in April 2016, they invented the destendedero, which I guess would translate it as kind of unhanging the clothesline, integrating their uh, work, tejiendo complices or weaving ties with, of solidarity into the context of a public demonstration in which they distributed secret messages inviting solidarity of the public in situations of gender violence in public spaces. This complex critical nature of the tenderero was evident in the closing activities of Meyer's retrospective that underlined the strategies of creating a community that empowers diversity and values humor and warmth, articulated in material and process-based aspects. Indeed, throughout the exhibition, Meyer, members of the Clothesline Workshop, and a number of invited performance artists and researchers of feminist art interrupted the usual solemnity of the museum and the physical and verbal normalization of the relationship to contemporary art to incite dialogue and physical performative actions, one of which we can see here in the in one occasion in which they put out all the re responses that have been received on what we called a mega tendedero or mega clothesline. For the closing day of the exhibit, the painful, diverse, and emotionally and politically charged content of the piece was additionally activated as participants in the exhibition team read aloud every one of the over 9,000 pink sheets corresponding to the four issues pinpointed, underlining among other aspects, the early age, consistently about six or seven years old, at which people recalled their first experience of harassment. And the proximity of the most recent cases of harassment, often on public transportation, that people took to get to the museum. To read out loud these testimonies, allowing them to resonate in the ears of the visitors who circulated throughout the exhibition, exacerbated the multi-sensorial quality of the work, which refused to let us separate our aesthetic from our political experience 
and our personal experience from the aesthetic and the political. Simultaneously, the Clothesline Workshop members incorporated the strategy of the Destendadero into the piece, as we can see here, inviting the museum visitors to take one of the letters on the clothesline that replaced the papers that were being read, individually inviting them to solidarity with other victims of harassment. And also throughout the day, a knitting circle in the galleries protagonized by the Jan Bombers or Lana Desastre Collective produced tiny blankets to cover and warmly embrace and cushion the pain embodied in each of the pink sheets of paper on the clothesline while creating a new instance for dialogue, solidarity, and conversation about art, feminism, and related topics in an informal small group format, echoing the historical feminist tradition and the effective turn of the performance piece embraces that also formed a part of the exhibition. In relation to the broader context of political art in Latin America since the 1970s, and as we can recall, a period um, characterized particularly by dictatorships, especially in the Southern Cone, and as well as a context of government repression in Mexico, the clothesline can be related to some of these initiatives, but also differ differentiated in relation to works that predominantly focus on physical actions in public spaces, or in some cases on poetic symbolic strategies. It shares with works like the Siluetazo in Argentina, seen here, or Lava la Bandera in Peru, the public collective visibilization of social violence and injustice. While in terms of methodology, perhaps a closer analogy can be made with the movement Embroidery for Peace, One Life, One Handkerchief, in which people gather in public spaces in Mexico to create and display embroidered cloths commemorating single victims of forced disappearance and setting up a kind of um, clothesline of these handkerchiefs. Like this initiative, the clothesline highlights the individuality and intimacy of personal testimony together with the acts of verbal and visual enunciation and sharing underlying the primacy of the act of remembering and that of critical reflection in a context of diversity and difference. The materiality and the use of space and color is a key element in marking an aesthetic posture that avoids a sacrosanct aura, inviting identification and an atmosphere conducive to participation where vulnerability and an openness to the other, even embodying the other, giving voice to the other, listening to the other, comforting the other, or mourning with the other is possible. In the past four years, the demand for the clothesline as a vehicle for creating dialogues around gender violence has multiplied geometrically and expanded internationally. The ever-increasing requests to reactivate the clothesline in different contexts have posed creative reflections for the artist regarding the future of the project, the different ways in which it has functioned in different contexts, and the specificity of activism through art, which characterizes this work, and which Monica will speak about in a moment. <laughs> the clothesline, thus, is a living piece that continually presents new practical, aesthetic, and theoretical challenges for the critical reconsideration of participatory feminist aesthetics as the work is constantly recontextualized in different localities. And as such, it continues to evolve, procreate, and underline the role of both the body and verbal testimony as sites of resistance and reconstructions of social ties, even as it marks the unrepresented. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. And uh, now we'll be hearing from the artist herself. Um, and I'm very glad to be here, even if it's virtually, unfortunately. 
I, I, I was planning, we were planning that this would be a physical meeting at some point, but uh, I'm very glad to be here. I'm very grateful for all the organizing that has gone into preparing this. The next slide, please. Um, it was March the 5th and you had this wonderful event. Everything was going so beautifully. And here in Mexico, a lot of things were going on, which I'll tell you about. And um, this time has uh, made me uh, sit down and think about the clothesline and think about the aspects that I'm, more interest, I'm, I'm most interested in right now, which are not just how it, it is replicated when I participate, like in the museum, but how it's then taken to other places. And this is a bit of what I want to take today, which is something I'm very enthusiastic about. So it's talking about the clothesline as activism and the different ways this has happened and as an educational tool and also what has happened to the clothesline during the pandemic. The next one, please. As I was telling you, it was March the 5th and it seemed like though we were taking the world, you know, all the demonstrations all over the place and all these events and the women's movement in general taking taking this strength. The next one, please. In, in Mexico, for example, during the month of March, we had um, tens, uh, dozens of, of clotheslines happening in many universities, which are very interesting because um, they were this kind of clotheslines where people were actually denounced, teachers were denounced, mostly in schools, secondary schools, universities. And um, it was very interesting because it's a kind of close line, which sometimes I have something to do with it and sometimes I had nothing to do with it. I didn't even hear about it until much later, but which are an interesting combination. Karen was just talking right now about other pieces of activism in Argentina in the, uh, okay, in the 80s, I think, you had all the, all the, um, the, the, the pieces where, uh, art, where, where people were denounced uh, literally in their in their name uh, and and these were were used I think these close lines have a lot to do with I forgot the word right now I'll probably think of it right now again I'm a bit nervous I don't like talking on these machines it's very strange because I'm not being I'm, not, I'm never able to see the audience which which makes me uh, have a have a connection but uh, I think these close lines have something to do with the uh, scratches, this is the name, the scratches that happened in Argentina, where since the law was not working, the community started denouncing the people who during the, the, the genocides that had taken place during the dictatorship in Argentina, since that wasn't working, then they were denounced publicly as the only way of working. Since something like that is pretty much similar in Mexico, where universities and schools have not really acted when there's when teachers have been denounced or students have are been denounced for for rape and harassment then the students have had to denounce them publicly so it has to do with this it has to do with the me too movement but the me too movement which came from that same impulse worked through through internet and through twitter because there's a large community in other countries where twitter works where you want when you want to denounce directly your teacher in a small school in Mexico, in a small town, Twitter doesn't help. Facebook doesn't help. You have to do it physically. So I think in Mexico, just before the, the pandemic started, we started seeing all these close lines that have to do with these other kinds of political movements as well, and that are being used as a tool to denounce in a situation where denouncing legally has not worked. The next one, please. One thing that has been very interesting for me is seeing how the clotheslines mutate. In 2019, we had the IT clothesline, and during the whole presentation at the museum, it changed because that was the, on the, you can see on the top left corner what the actual clothesline looked like. And then there was a case of censorship at the Triennale where an exhibition that had to do with, uh, with censorship, with works of art that had been censored was closed down and there was a very violent situation because that Triennale and the people who worked in it, their lives were threatened. Uh, they were 
very badly harassed, schools nearby were threatened if that exhibition opened again. So here we had this situation in which an exhibition that had to do with censorship was censored. And basically the Latin American artists who are used to this kind of thing, uh, Tania Bruguera, Regina Jose Galindo, Javier Telles, Pia Camille, myself, we said we can't do this, so we decided to close our pieces. So the closed line, you can see the image at the, at the top on the right, closed down, you can close that piece like the video, so it closed down and uh, all the answers were taken down and blank pieces of paper were torn and thrown onto the floor. However, the Japanese artist asked me if they could use the same structure of the closed line to talk about censorship and talk about freedom of experience. And they placed it right outside, right, right outside where the, the censored exhibition was. So this was really interesting to me. Could we have this, the next one, please? But also that uh, from the group that came out of a workshop I gave there, they started using the clothesline piece in these uh, small demonstrations they're having in, in Japan that have to do with changing the law, very much like the Indiana clothesline, uh, because the law over there is that someone who has been raped or harassed has to prove they did absolutely everything humanly possible to stop the harassment. So even if you're a six-year-old girl who was raped uh, by a relative or a friend of the family or, or someone like that, you have to prove that you did everything you could. So the, the Japanese women are, trying, are getting together and doing these demonstrations to try to change this law. So I find it very interesting that on the one hand, the clothesline is working where the law isn't responding. And on the other hand, the clothesline is working where we want to change the law. The next one, please. Karen mentioned uh, in 2015 in Colombia, uh, I suddenly got an email from a teacher who had used the clothesline as a tool in her classroom uh, an 8th of March to ask the, the students about the different ideas they had about, about the gender in general, which I found very interesting because I had never thought about. The clothesline is a piece that has grown on its own. I mean, I have collaborated and, and people who have worked in the different uh, clotheslines have collaborated and we have proposed things, but it has also grown on its own as it becomes viral. The next one, please. Um, it has also worked in educational contexts. Um, a couple of years ago, I started working in a series of clotheslines in Portland. And it was really interesting to me that they decided to do one, the Martin Luther King Jr. Elementary School. And there we also had to think of how do you adapt it? How do you change it? How do you ask a question? so that the students feel very free. In that case, is what the question was something like, what, what would make your life at school better? Instead of asking what is wrong with the school, what would make your life better, which uh, showed everyone what the, what the things that were worrying the kids were. But it's also interesting to me of how it's being used with, and with different ages in different situations. The next one, please. In Chihuahua, I went in 2017, and this one is very interesting. This is in the north of, of Mexico, because we gave, I gave a workshop, and it was part of the, a university activity, and we went out in the street. Uh, the next one, please. And then the student, the, the people who had participated in decided to continue using it. Obviously, we were in touch, but they were doing it completely on their own. So it's very interesting because they, they decided to go to every single faculty at the university over a period of three years. They've been doing it for three years now so, so that every single one was, uh, was covered. And I was talking yesterday to Erika Rascon, who's been organizing this, and she was saying it is very interesting because now when they go, when they go to, a, to a faculty, they start this clothesline which as usual with my clotheslines is anonymous. And we usually ask people not to name uh, harassers because legally it's very complicated here and can affect 
the possibility of uh, having a formal uh, kind of action take place. So, but it's very interesting because they, they start the clothesline and then what has started happening is that two weeks later, the students have done their own clothesline denouncing teachers because they have not received an answer. So it's very interesting how it sort of opens the possibility of, uh, of speaking up and of getting together and of organizing as young students and then doing their own clothesline in the terms they consider necessary to, to have them. The next one, please. This is another case where it was in a, in a high school and it was actually the high school where, where I studied, uh, part, of the, part of my high school. And it was organized by the, by the students. So I was very glad to go give a talk over there. And they had decided to organize a, a clothesline. And we had to think very carefully about it because it's, uh, a school is a private place, but not. So if we can have the, the next one, please. There were answers, for example, that like one, no, the, the one in the middle on the left side that says, I lost my virginity because of my uncle. I couldn't move in two days. So disgusted that I couldn't eat for three days. An answer of this kind is very difficult if you're in a school where everybody knows you to go and hang it up yourself. You don't have the freedom that usually you might have in a public space where nobody knows you and it's 5,000 answers. So yours will get lost there. So we decided to do the, to put this box and um, the box also helped people were invited to, if they had wanted to, if there were any, any teachers that were being denounced or any experiences they had had in the school of harassment, then they could put it there. It would not be hung up, but it would be given to the, to the, to the teachers. So it's, it has forced us to think of ways of, uh, opening a dialogue, accompanying the, the, the people who are dis, uh, denouncing harassment, forcing the, the authorities to really look into this without being on the defensive, which they would be on the defensive if the names of teachers started coming, coming up. You also have to do work there afterwards so the, the authorities, the, the headmaster and stuff do something, really do something about it. The next one, please. Another case where the piece went off on its own, which, I, which is what I love the most, was in Argentina, which I first did it uh, as, a, as a project for the clothesline and gave a workshop. And it was presented outside museums and in, in this uh, area with this organization called El Trapito, which is a community-based uh, organization. So there we were very close to the people who were we're actually answering the, the clothesline, a popular area of the city. The next one, please. But what was really the most interesting to me, uh, the next one, please, was that, um, that the, the, now we also went to the art school uh, in La Plata, in, uh, in, in where, where it, uh, I'm very interested in, when it's very interested in having it at educational facilities. The next one, please. But it was very interesting to me that from the workshop I gave, three teachers from the Normal Cinco, which is also a high school, attended, mm -hmm. and they decided to do it with their students. Mm -hmm. So with, with their students thinking about these problems of doing it inside the school, they decided to go outside into their local neighborhood and ask for the answers. They were not answers that came from the school itself, but the students participated in this process. And a few months later, I got a mail from the students that the high school, uh, very near them, another high school, there had been a case of a young trans uh, uh, woman who had committed suicide because of such of all the bullying. And they were asking me if they could if they could do it, if they could do a clothesline that talk about talked about these issues. So I was really glad and really. Uh, grateful that they would take the clothesline to use it on their own for whatever they needed, the students themselves. The next one, please. It's also interesting to me 
that uh, the clothesline is being used in the middle is Monica Benitez to do research that has to do with the answers. And she calls these, uh, these uh, archives that, that, are, that come parallel to works of art, the next one please, that she accomplishes archives, that she then uses to, to collateral archives, that she, that she then analyzes it. And that is something as an artist, obviously, I can't do, but it is being used politically, uh, academically, et cetera. The next one, please. These are some of the answers that she has. In Mexico, the most common word is, uh, that comes out from the clotheslines is fear. The next one, please. In uh, Washington, joy, uncomfortable, and uh, and shocked were the most the, the words most used in the clothesline. The next one, please. And um, uh, another aspect I'm very interested. The Karen also mentioned some of some of it here was uh, using the clothesline to create networks. So in Culiacan, Karen curated an exhibition and gave a workshop, and then we worked jointly with a with a group of artists so that they could continue. Um, making artwork and getting together. The next one, please. But the place where it has worked the most has been in Tuxtla Gutierrez in Chiapas, where I also worked with a group of, of, of artists and uh, with the purpose of, of creating community uh, over there, which they already had, obviously, but they wanted to make more solid. The next one, please. And we organized this exhibition where the clothesline was exhibited, but also work the whole group did collectively, and also work that each of them made individually. The next one, please. They also did an archive of the, of the feminist movement in, in their region, which was very interesting. I'm always very insistent about our history being together. The next one, please. And they also took the clothesline to other places in their state, which uh, I think was also uh, very, very important. They continue using it as a tool. The next one, please. And it's still a community. We're all still very much in touch. They're all very much in touch. And it's a very loving community. So I'm very pleased with all this pain, we're able to build, build loving community. The next one, please. Uh, during the clothesline, one of the things that happened is that obviously we can't go out. So in Colombia, they did um, a, a digital clothesline. They have an exhibition usually where they choose one piece from their community, from their collection, and, and have, they may make an exhibition with this work and other works related to these issues. And they decided to use the clothesline, but obviously the museum was still closed. So we had to, to do a, a digital clothesline, which to me is a very interesting possibility today. The next one, please. Um, one of the things that I've been working on during the pandemic is making a, a blog that is specifically on the different versions of the clothesline with all the text and newspaper clippings and all the materials that have been that have been written about and all the documents that have to do with the different versions of the clothesline. I'm still working on it, but that has been a result of the pandemic. The next one, please. One of the projects I'm also working in with right now is this book called Intimidades o No, in uh, Arte, Vida y Feminismo, which will put together 40 years of my writings. And uh, it is very significant that it starts with the first close line. It starts with my going with the, my journals and letters going to the United States and doing the experiences of doing the first close line. So I think in that way it will be an interesting document that talks about these things. And the last one, please. I wanted to end with this Instagram um, entry of a young artist who, which I saw just a few days ago. And um, I, I, she dresses up with a clothesline. But what made me, what moved me the most is that she mentioned that uh, the first time she participated in the clothesline, she had the sensation of feeling accompanied. And I think that's the most important part of the piece, that when we read it, we feel 
we are being accompanied and we feel that, that we are not alone. And so in that way, uh, because the clothesline in Indiana has come from such a strong community base and has had such a warm reception at New Fields, I decided with the donation to donate it with the possibility of it being an installation of what has happened, a documentary installation, but also it being a, 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 it can be a reactivation. So whenever it is presented, the same questions that, that were decided by the, by originally can be presented and answered. But I also want the piece to continue to have a life of its own. So it, is, they can also, it can also be reactivated with a new group, if a new group wants to work and participate with new questions. And because of the pandemic and what I've learned during the pandemic, it can also uh, be used as a, digitally. So I think it's interesting for me to see how many possibilities of a, of a work to then take a life of its own and that it can allow us to continue feeling accompanied whenever it is necessary to feel accompanied. I'll end by saying that I hope one day we'll get to a clothesline where people don't answer because there's no harassment anymore. So that would really be the success of the clothesline. But until then, I just hope it can be used in any way we want. So that will be, so that will be all on my own. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, at this point, I think, so. uh, I think, I think we, we will go ahead, go ahead and um, address some of the questions um, that have come in through the chat. Um, I did have a question, though, um, sort of about the work in relation uh, to the various institutions that you've worked with. Um, given that the, the form of El Tenderero is shape shifting, and that the content changes. Um, you know, this. I'm sure you've experienced uh, that. Uh, this has been a challenge for many institutions, and how how has that played out um, in the past? And um, what what are the what are some of the things that um, you've done to address that? It 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 has been a challenge in many ways. Um, Karen knows this well. It's a piece that grows, for example, even physical things, you know? It's a piece that grows, and if you had thought it was going to need, have space for 800 answers, but suddenly it's 9,000 answers, mm -hmm. then how can you work with an institution so it can respond to the physical needs of this kind of change? It has a challenge of, uh, 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 it, it, it's a piece that usually needs a lot of mediation, what do you do with someone who starts crying? What information can you give the audience on institutions nearby that can help them legally and psychologically, et cetera, uh, in, in ter terms of containment? Um, I have not met yet the problem of, of censorship, of having a question uh, that suddenly they might not, a university might not want the question have you ever been harassed at a university? But we've thought about it. Uh, I've had the problem of, uh, for example, a university teachers being immediately uh, uh, denounced. And what does the, how does the, the institution react in this case? Or uh, a teacher writing to me directly because he had been denounced at the university and that this was a whole legal issue at the university. So how to, for me, the challenge is how do we make the institution respond with their best tools? If it's a, a, at a university, I would suggest have talks about uh, denouncing, have talks about harassment, have educational programs that have to do with these issues. Don't turn it into a legal battle, turn it into an educational battle. So I think that those are the kind of, of challenges for an, 
or an institution that you really have to be, they have to be aware of, uh, of the role they play in, in, the, in the piece. When I'm available or when we're available, like Karen and I were here at the, at the MOAC, we were there constantly working on these issues. And when there's been questions, we, I usually, with institutions, we usually talk about it and, and try to, to solve it. But yeah, it's a, it's a challenge because mm -hmm. it's a live piece. It's not just an object you hang. Sure. And Karen, how has that played out for you as an administrator? Um, well, I'm not really an administrator. I'm actually a, a curator. I don't know. I, I, but um, I think I think I very much agree with everything that Monica has mentioned. And I think it is important if one is like working with institutions or as a curator creating these types of projects. Mm -hmm. It's very important to have a lot of contact with the educational and mediation areas of museums or in some cases public public spaces that have to do with public cultural institutions because in many cases institutions are not familiar with or comfortable with uh, this kind of unknown or unbridled uh, possibilities of a piece they want to know exactly how much it's how, how big it's going to be what the what the size of everything that on it is going to be, and what uh, what is going to happen in relation to it. So the fact that things can happen which are not planned or not they perhaps they can't even imagine is is very disturbing for institutions who have, that have specific rules for the preservation for the security of of the objects. Now, so I think it's very important also that there be a process of kind of uh, creating consciousness in the institutions and the people that will be involved precisely in administrating the spaces where uh, a clothesline takes place so that they understand how this is a piece that takes on a life of its own and why that is the case and why that is an integral part of the piece. This happened to us with this has happened to us also with activations of other works of Monica's in her exhibition in the Mock and in other places uh, because things happen that that people aren't aren't planned that aren't planned and because people get involved personally and emotionally with the work in the space of the museum it's not just this passive art experience where you go and you look and maybe you feel something or you think something or you say oh that's beautiful or that's nice and then you go home so it's a very different experience and that's deliberate on the part of the work so i think it's very important to create that type of consciousness which is also the case also of of other other works of contemporary art but in my case as a feminist curator that's something i'm particularly interested in that the work is not just a work which is there, but the work is there doing something. Something is happening as a result of the work. And that's an integral part of the conception of the exhibition or of the event. It's not just a, a parallel activity, as it's often called um, in Mexico. It's not sort of something that happens, a little lecture or, or a talk mm -hmm. or something like that. It's part of the ongoing process of the piece itself. Um, so I think this actually ties nicely um, to a couple of questions that we have here in the chat. Um, so one question that we have are what, what are some of the steps um, between the implementation of a project like the clothesline uh, to formal action and where have you seen the most success? And then um, we have a question here as well that asks, um, in other countries, is there uh, an achievement such as consent legislation um, in the case of rape, um, which has been the goal um, in Indiana, um, has, has there been any similar action um, as a direct result of work like this? I think that the, the closest is the, the flower demonstrations in Japan, but the flower demonstrations are not being organized by the clothesline. The clothesline is just participating in the, in the demonstrations, which is very different, that they are seeking the same the same thing. 
no, I'm I'm very surprised that that was what has happened at the close line in Indiana, precisely because it's taking it to another step. I have never seen it used as a as a as a tool for actual change. So I will be very interested in seeing this part. And I have no idea how you're doing it. In that way, it's when it's so wonderful because it's a piece that we're collaborating completely. I'm I'm just sort of giving giving advice. But the piece is happening because it's because of Women for Change, because of the museum, because of the how every every community, every county has organized and taken the piece as as their own. Mm -hmm. So I think that's that's very different. You will have to tell me how it works. I hope it works. Um. Yeah, and I was actually wondering if you could speak to that a little a little further. Um, just because um, collaboration is uh, centered within your work, um, you know, I, this challenges uh, a lot of you know traditional notions of authorship. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your decision to to center community and collaboration within the process. I think this is a piece that does not work if it doesn't have a community base. It just simply doesn't. I can go there and make the actions and the clothesline, but if it doesn't really have this kind of collaboration, it makes no sense, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And even less if it's going to reverberate or, or take off on its own as a piece. So I think the authorship is, is, is shared. I mean, I might have done it a long time ago, but each experience of the clothesline is completely different because we are doing it together. So usually it has the, it, 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 they have the, the credits of, of, of everyone participating uh, closely in, in selecting the questions on, on making it, on, on having it happen. So I think it's basic. I think it, it, uh, it challenges this idea of art being done by, uh, a genius, which is usually male and European, and uh, not through collaborative process. I think it's always done through collaborative processes, and we just don't recognize it. And I also think, since the, the, the way we work, as just like Karen was saying, we don't think of an exhibition as an end, but as a means. Uh, I don't think as a piece only of talking about harassment, but also of making community. So it has all these different levels, which for me are very important and, and, and have to do with the feminist vision of, of art. I just maybe wanted to add to that, that I think this is another important aspect that um, which in the history of the piece became uh, key, which is the aspect of creating the questions out of a dialogue out of a workshop and which Monica implemented precisely first in, in Medellin and that now has become an integral part of the piece. And I think that's really important and it's also a very important aspect in terms of the reactivations of the piece, at least in the, in, on the occasions when, when Monica is involved in reactivating it because obviously there are other spontaneous processes which have their own dynamics and their and their own way of working, but I think it's 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 very important that process of reflection and that process of thinking about what can be asked and how to ask it, choosing the words even for the questions. When we worked in Culiacan, for example, they um, were not comfortable and didn't feel that they identified it with with the word harassment, uh, uh, um, acoso, as it's used in Mexico, as of something that people would understand in their community, and they wanted the world maltrato, mistreatment. So in every community, there's specific connotations and usages of the words, and also possibilities of interaction, as Monica mentioned in the case of the, uh, the, the res responses in the school, which were put into a box rather than hung up on the clothesline. So all that sensitivity to the process is a part of the work itself. It's not just kind of the work is the clothesline there and the, and this is all things that, that happen around it. I think it's really important to understand that the work is everything that happens from the moment in which people get together and decide 
to do this and then the, all the dynamics that take place th those are all key because they also contribute to community building they, can, they contribute to dialogue they can contribute to resolving differences in the case of the mock clothesline in the first meeting of the workshop there were a group of men that wanted to be involved and some of the women wanted them to be involved and some of them didn't want them to be involved so all of this part of a, a part of a process which really is part of the part of the artwork and part of Monica's personal I, I would say genius because she just <laughs> denounced that word but her personal talent is precisely using these abilities that have to do with what she learned with Suzanne Lacey about social um, uh, social practice art of creating dynamics within the groups in order to be able to move forward with the project even in groups where there are significant differences. Great, thank you. Um, it looks like we've got just a couple more questions um, uh, specifically pertaining to uh, the work as it's being collected by the museum. Um, so, you know, I'm happy to answer these questions, but feel free to chime in if either of you have um, any input as well. Uh, the first of which is how long will uh, the work be exhibited at New Fields and what will related activities be? Um, I will say that uh, we have yet to enter into the planning processes for exhibition of El Tenderero just simply because we are currently working our way through the acquisition process. Um, but my hope is to have the work um, installed as soon as we possibly can. Um, and I think that the you know, the work presents a lot of advantages um, in comparison to works that use similar materials just simply because um, so much of the work is about the archive itself, it's about the interaction, um, and as such, it's not necessarily um, subjected to the same same restrictions that, um, a, you know, let's say like a, a print on paper might present. Um, Another question that came up was how can uh, we make El Tenderero accessible to the underrepresented communities yeah, that really can't afford to visit new fields and what attempts are being made to reach these okay. communities. Um, so again, uh, we have yet to enter into the, the planning stages for how, how the wor work will operate within an institutional context. I will say, however, though, that because this work originated in public, um, I, I don't think we can rule out the possibility that it may be reactivated in public in this way again. Um, and so while, you know, I believe that, um, you know, it will, it will be great in a gallery context, um, I'm also particularly excited to see it, um, you know, living out in the wild um, and, you know, uh, being activated in collaboration with communities um, and organizations that serve these communities well into the future. Um, I just wanted to mention that since I think that the idea of the digital and the dero that was explored as a result of the pandemic in mm -hmm. in, in Colombia, um, I think is also an interesting aspect of having the idea of having that whole archive available mm -hmm. online or or through the museum is is a very interesting aspect because uh, the sheer quantity of the information and the possibility of sort of going back and seeing how people answered, I, I think is, is very interesting. It really opens up, as has been the case with Monica Benitez's work, um, mm -hmm. a whole series of possibilities of the piece of provoking different levels of reflection and comparison, and even between close lines, comparing the, the ways that people use language and the ways that they express their personal experience. Wonderful. Um, well, it looks like uh, our time is just about up. Um, Karen and Monica, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to join us in this discussion. Um, thank you again to Patricia and uh, to Women for Change and um, again to Ann M. Stack as well. Um, if you enjoyed today's program, uh, please consider joining us tomorrow at noon for a conversation examining the intersection of art and activism. Um, for more information on this discussion, um, please visit uh, discovernewfields.org. 
Um, and then also, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to um, the Arts Council of Indianapolis um, and Gallery 924. Um, there's currently an exhibition titled El Tendedero, The Clothesline Indiana, Homage and Celebration, which will be on display throughout the month of November. Um, so if you're in Indianapolis, please be sure to visit. Um, again, thank you all for joining us and hopefully we will see you tomorrow. Thank you very much.